Hello, and thank you for joining in for today's webinar. I have a few announcements before I get started. The Johnson Center hosts free webinars throughout the year. You can join our email list and stay up to date on all events and opportunities by clicking on the Join Our Email List link on our website. That's www.johnson-center.org. We also post new we also post news to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts, and these are great sites to stay up to date on news like webinars, scholarship, research opportunities, and more. And be sure to check out our library of past presentations on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the Johnson Center. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they also host several great, web great webinars and share some great resources on their website and social media pages. We currently have some terrific family support programs here at the Johnson Center, including grants and sliding fee scales for diagnostic services, counseling support, and more. If you'd like more information, please contact us at info at johnson-center.org. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes, or look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It will contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have any questions during the live webinar, please type them into your GoToWebinar control panel or email info at johnson-center.org. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, you may email questions to the presenter at info at johnson-center.org. Today's webinar is presented by me, Amanda Tammy. I'm a board certified behavior analyst and a licensed professional counselor at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. I provide behavior analytic services and psychotherapy to children and adults on the autism spectrum and their families. I also work with co-occurring conditions such as anxiety, depression, ADHD, and trauma, and I have specialized training in EMDR therapy and its applications to children. In addition to therapy, I provide, I provide training and consultation to parents and providers on various topics, including building emotion regulation, support across the lifespan, and trauma-informed ABA. Let's get started. So today we're gonna to be talking about preparing for back to school during COVID-19. And there is still so much that no one knows and so much that we're all figuring out as we go along. So today will be by no means exhaustive, but rather just kind of a starting point where we're all in this brand new world, this brand new back to school journey. And I hope that some of the ideas and suggestions that I give you will help um, as, as a starting point and help you to problem solve some of the things that we know or that we can predict are, are going to come up. This webinar is for informational purposes only, and I can't offer clinical or case specific advice during the webinar or through email. So can, can I'm sorry, consult your healthcare provider or contact the Johnson Center to schedule an appointment for any case specific medical or clinical questions. I also want to mention before I jump into the material that I am working from home uh, and have my kids here with me. I'm crossing my fingers that I have them sufficiently set up with what they can be doing for the next hour and I can give this presentation without interruption, but if there's any background noise or you hear anyone calling for mom, that is the reason why. Let's hope that uh, we can get through this hour without that. All right. So in this new learning world, we know that there are going to be lots of challenges, lots of um, new experiences and new problems to solve, lots of things that we're gonna have to figure out and um, figure out for ourselves and for our kids and how all of this is gonna work. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of those things include safe learning. What is the learning environment going to be like and how are we gonna keep it safe? So many questions about the face masks. What's going to happen? How, how are we going to get kids to wear them? What happens if kids won't wear them? And lots of questions about the new routines. What's it going to look like? How am I going to, you know, get help my kid understand the new routine, especially when it might involve lots of changes or 
um, especially for like a hybrid situation with both remote and in-person learning. So let's just go over some of those quickly and then we'll we'll talk about the um, some some solutions, some things that you can can try. So so many parents right now are having to make the choice or their on their kids' behalf about whether their kids are going to return to the classroom for traditional in-person learning or if it's going to be online, if they're going to do a full online um, learning with no in-person um, learning at all. Now, some states and school districts at this point are still working on those plans or, or making changes to what they have already started or what they've decided on. And this is <clears throat> makes the, the choice even harder for parents because you can't make a plan until you know what the options are. And once you have made that choice and your child starts school, it's not only possible, but highly likely that, you know, a few weeks or months into the school year, things might change again. The school may have to close or the school may have to um, change their, their technology systems that they're using once we find what's working or not working. So for so many parents, it's a really difficult time because you're trying to make these choices on your kid's behalf, they're really difficult decisions to begin with. There are lots of options right now, some of them not even definitive options or you don't know what your school is gonna offer. So it's really hard to make a plan and, and create a routine around all this newness, especially when you're still trying to work it out yourself. Even harder when you have a kid with ASD or, or a kid who really, needs to have routine, needs to know what to expect, or needs to know what's what's coming up next. So I know that so many parents are worried about that making that decision. What is the right answer? What is best for my child? Going back to school or doing schooling online, completely different homeschooling options than we've ever considered before. Um, a, a, a hybrid model, can my child handle that? Is that what's best for my child? And the answer, unfortunately, is there is no right answer. No one can tell you that the decision that you have made or are going to make is the right one. There is no right answer. So as you're thinking about this, or as you probably at this point may have already made these decisions, but you know, are are worried. Was it the right decision? I know I'm still worried about that for my own kids. Some of the things that you need to consider would be: What are the health conditions of your child and your family? Who is your child going to be around? Who may um, have a compromised immune system, or that we have to be extra careful to not expose someone in the child's life to anything that they might bring home from school. COVID or otherwise, we know that especially young kids just are always coming home from school or daycare with a cold or something. So it's not just COVID, but I think at this point, we're all much more worried about even um, less extreme illnesses because as soon as the symptoms start, you don't know that it's not COVID or, or something more serious. So, you know, as we're as we're thinking about what is the right choice for your family, we need to consider the health conditions of the family and the child specifically. Also, we need to be thinking very much about what does the child want? Beyond how we as parents expect our children to be able to learn best, we also need to consider what the child wants and what they're most comfortable with because we absolutely need to have that child's buy-in. If you are trying to do online schooling and the child does not want that, they are not interested in online schooling, it is going to be really hard to motivate your child to sit down and do the work or to log into their class when they need to be or to, to, to pay attention and not do something else on the computer when they're supposed to be uh, watching their teacher in their virtual classroom. So we have to get our kids buy-in. 
as we make these decisions and choose what we're going to do for their education. Start to think about what success will look like for your child in whatever school option or learning modality you choose. Um, I know in the spring, many parents were concerned because they felt like with the online learning, their kids were learning less or learning less effectively, or a lot of what they were doing was more busy work. And maybe at this point, if that's still what school looks like or seems like to you as parents, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's okay for your child right now. If life is really stressful right now for your child, if the idea of going back to school during a pandemic is too much, then maybe we define success as completing the work that, that is given to us at home, even if maybe we feel like our child could, could have handled more if they were in school. Maybe the opposite is true. Maybe they do much better at home and you can think more about what's, what they can accomplish and think more about how to help them reach those, <clears throat> those um, levels of achievement. And beyond academics, what will success look like just in getting the work done or in how they're going to learn? Maybe with, an, with, with um, a homeschooling or online learning type of system, there's a lot more room for project-based learning or um, e experiential learning. And that is a different definition of success. Um, what, what will homework success be like? Are you going to be asking your child to do homework? Is school asking your child to do homework? And how are we going to make that happen? And how are we going to be successful with homework? Um, if your child isn't in school, we also need to be thinking about the child's social needs. And this is very important for all of the kids. Um, you know, the social interaction with their peers at school is such a big part of a student's life. And I know for my own kids, it's been increasingly difficult as the time has gone on that they've had to stay away from their friends. And there's been a lot more fights at home and um, a lot more frustration with the fact that we can't see friends. But then on top of that, for our students with autism, we need to be thinking about how we're going to be teaching social skills and helping them gain that social experience, not just because of their human nature, but because of the, the, the skill development. So if your child isn't going to, to, to in-person classrooms, they're not going to a traditional learning environment or to a, um, a homeschool pod or, or something like that, how are you going to meet your child's social needs? So just some things to think about as you consider this decision and, and what's right for your family. Again, there is no right or wrong. There's no right answer here. So whatever you're choosing is the right answer. Um, some schools are looking at hybrid systems of instruction, which can make uh, creating a routine especially difficult. And we know that routines are especially important for our kids with autism. But even if you're not looking at a hybrid system, you're probably looking at brand new schedules, brand new routines, new requirements. Everything just looks different this year than anything we're used to in the past. So we'll talk um, a little bit about some ways to make that easier. There are so many questions and concerns with the face masks, um, not just for students with ASD, but certainly a lot more questions for our students with ASD. Um, the sensory issues, breathing issues, the newness, the inability to understand, and so much is still unknown. What are schools going to do if my child with autism refuses to wear a mask or, or cannot wear the mask? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, how will schools ensure that kids wear masks properly and don't use them as toys or, or don't share them? Again, we don't know. Um, a lot of this maybe 
uh, specific to your the state where you live or the school district or the, the individual school where you are. Um, they may have their own policies about this that might differ from school to school or district to district. And even with that, we, we don't know what's going to happen because no one has done this before. No one has had to worry about keeping face masks on kids in school before. So we don't know. We don't know the answer. Can my child go to school if they won't wear the face mask? First of all, it depends on, your, on the school and their policy. And second, we don't know. We don't know what the school is going to do um, when that situation comes up. So let's talk about some strategies and what you can do to um, start preparing and make this stuff possible. So first of all, explain the whys behind any of the changes. Talk to your kids proactively about what to expect, what school is going to be like, whether that's at home or in the school building. Talk about all of the changes that they can expect. And importantly, talk about the whys. Why? Is school going to be at home this year? Why are we wearing a face mask? And and go into as much detail as you can and as thorough of an explanation as, as you can that the child will understand. You know, if we say, um, well, we have to wear a mask because of coronavirus, that's an explanation. But if you if your child can understand something more thorough, like well, we have to wear the face mask because of the coronavirus and the face mask prevents the uh, respiratory droplets from being able to be spread from person to person. So if I wear my mask and you wear your mask, we're actually really safe from the coronavirus and it helps us to not get it. You know, if kids have all the information, if they have the explanation, it's empowering. Kids can feel like, Ah, uh, yes, this um, this is what I'm doing, and here's why. There's a reason for it, and I want to do it. You can use social stories at home or at school. Teachers, it's great for teachers to incorporate these into the classroom as well. Uh, but you can also do it at home, talking about what to expect at school and talking about new routines at home new behavior expectations or behavior requirements like wearing a mask or washing your hands. Um, even social stories about what coronavirus is or, or what COVID is, helping kids understand what the risk is and how to protect themselves. <laughs> Make learning visual as much as possible. Uh, create visuals for hand washing, for social distancing, you know, um, stickers on the floor to show how far apart kids should stand. This is something you can practice at home. You can, you know, put stickers on the floor at home to help kids be able to gauge how far six feet is. Um, visuals for wearing face masks, where and when to wear the face mask, you know, uh, teaching kids what that that face mask symbol means that if they see the little icon of a face with a mask on it, that means that if they're at that location, they have to wear a mask. Um, of course, visual schedules and calendars are always helpful, and um, I highly encourage the use of a visual schedule either in the classroom or for at home learning. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And then for kids who are doing hybrid learning, um, a mix of, of both online and in-person school, I suggest using some type of a calendar that would be visible and that your child can see what, what day it is today and what type of school they have today, or like for the rest of the week, what type of schooling they have today and what, what is coming in the next couple of days. 
you know, that um, change in routine between online and in school learning can be um, it can be really stressful and really difficult because the routine is inconsistent. One day it's this routine because I'm at home and the next day it's a totally separate routine because I have to get to school and then follow the school routine. So if we can uh, use visuals like this to make to make it easier as far as when to expect which routine and um, when am I going to be leaving the house again? That is um, really helpful if, if we can make it visual and give kids a way to expect it and understand what is coming up next. There we go. Point out all the things that are staying the same. Yes, we are living in a totally new world. Everything, well, lots and lots of things are different than we're used to. School is a very different environment. It may even be a, 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 a wholly different environment if school is at home now instead of in the school building. Learning, regardless of home or at school, is going to have some differences and social interaction is certainly very different. But there are always those things that, that stay the same. There are some things that have not changed. Um, your kid might be riding the same bus to school. They might have the same teacher or be in the same classroom. It might look different, but there are things that are still the same. Um, they might be using the same programs online that they have used before. They may still get to pack their own lunch, whether they're at home or going to school. Maybe part of the morning routine is making and packing their lunch. Um, beyond school, we, we still all have dinner together every night, or um, we still read a bedtime story before bed every night. We still do homework at this time. What are the things that are staying the same? And in this world of so many changes and so many differences from what we have known or what we knew from school in the past, it might feel like there's not a lot that stays the same. So you can even find those very tiny details, find those things that are that that seem not important. Um, you you have the same type of chair, or um, you, or you're you're using the same your same favorite lead pencil that you used last year. Just find the smallest details because that sameness that consistency of what we know, and I can find comfort in what I already know and what, what I know is going to be the same, can be very calming, can be very grounding. That Okay, everything feels different and everything feels out of my control, but this is what I do know. And this I do know how to do, or this I do know what to expect. So find even the smallest things to point out that they're staying the same. Let's talk specifically about online learning for a few minutes. Um, there is a lot of concern from parents that I'm hearing about online learning. And um, those concerns are certainly real. And there are a lot of concerns with online learning that there at this point is not an answer to, either because we don't know or because online learning is new and maybe not something that our kids know how to do or are capable of. So I'll give you some, some suggestions, but know that, again, this is a new world. Um, most of our, at least our young kids, I know some uh, older middle and, and high school kiddos have done um, possible online schooling before, but until this past spring, for so many of us, it's a brand new experience, especially for younger kids. So the concerns are real, the concerns are valid, and there are things that we're gonna have to work through, figure out, and ultimately online learning may be a long-term game. 
you know, teaching kids to be successful with online learning may take years. We may have to be working with our kids for years to teach them how to do this if, if um, online learning were to continue. Um, so first I wanna mention the need for schedules. If you are doing homeschooling or you are doing virtual learning on the computer, it is incredibly important to stick to a, a routine, to develop a schedule for school days and stay with that. Um, this is what we, this is the schedule we're gonna stick to. If you can make it a visual schedule, even better. Um, and incorporate lots of opportunities for breaks, especially movement breaks. We need to get our kids up and moving, get them away from the computer so that they're able to attend to a computer. That is true for in-person learning as well. Kids need those movement breaks. Kids need those breaks from having to, to take in the instruction. But it's, it, it's even more so important when we're expecting kids to do self-paced learning on a computer or um, watch their teacher through a screen instead of in-person. We need to be giving them that opportunity for breaks, especially movement breaks. Also, if your child has an IEP, which many kids with autism do, the school still has to meet the accommodations and the modifications and the goals of the IEP, even in online learning. So talk to your schools, if you haven't already, and find out how they're going to help you to make this work in a way that is safe and effective for the child. The school is responsible for helping us come up with solutions. The school is responsible for making sure that your um, student with an IEP can learn and learns effectively. Um, so talk to them about that. If, if online learning is what you have chosen for your child, if online learning is what you have chosen for your child, that is your choice and that is an excellent choice. And the child's school needs to help you make sure that they learn effectively. So how are they going to do that? It doesn't all need to fall on you. For at-home learning, organization is absolutely key. So. I would encourage you to create a designated study space. So this table or this desk or this part of the, um, the, the house or the room is where we're doing our schoolwork. This is your school space or your, your um, workspace. This should be a space with limited distractions, as few distractions as, as possible. Now I know that the computer itself is a distraction um, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes but um, proactively plan for the need for that that designated study space and have that set up before school starts proactively plan for organization as well um, involve your child Involve your child in the um, plan for organizing if they're capable of that, if that's um, a skill that they are ready to learn and they are um, able to participate in figuring out a plan or, or figuring out how to organize. It's a great skill that even as, an, as adults, we all need to be able to, to organize. So color coding, color coding for different subjects, um, on a visual schedule, maybe you include information for each uh, class, for each teacher, or exactly who. Um, I'm so sorry, I have a, a, a kid crying in the background. Um, if you, uh, so, so sorry, I <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. Color coding, I think, is what I was talking about. Color coding uh, materials for each subject. 
maybe color coding your visual schedule to you know match the materials that they need for that subject uh, maybe on the visual schedule you make it a much more detailed schedule that includes the um, the class the materials that are needed for it who the teacher is any expectations any any um, information that kids will need right away or that they that they would need regularly and they can just refer back to all of the information in the same place or all of the information for that specific class in the same place. Uh, plan ahead for your child's needs. So for example, um, when we sit down for online schooling, have a bottle of water all ready for them, make sure they have used the restroom beforehand, take away the opportunity for um, you know, avoidance or distractions or, well, I can't start yet because I have to use the bathroom. Plan ahead for those, those needs, anything that would, um, you know, could, could be used as to, to avoid or, or procrastinate getting started. Again, stick to a routine, incorporate lots of breaks, limit distractions. Um, and then as far as using the computer, the computer is an inherent distraction and there is no way around that. The computer has, you know, it's really easy to switch from one screen to the next. It is really easy to, um, to, to get distracted by something else that might be on the screen. And this is, this is true for every person, adult, child, no matter their age, the computer is a distraction. It's especially true for kids who, sorry, excuse me, for kids who um, have not, who, whose frontal lobes have not fully developed. And that is every child. Our frontal lobes are the part of our brain that can help us to stay on track, to, to stay focused despite distractions. Um, so we should expect, we absolutely should expect that the computer will be a distraction for your child. If you have the ability to do so, I would encourage you to collaborate with your child and ask them, how do you want me to help you learn? How do you want me to help you when you're distracted? Make it a collaborative problem solving process. Oh, I noticed that when um, your teacher was asking each student to share information about themselves that you were you know, doing something else or you had a hard time um, paying attention during that part. What could we do differently? How can I help you be able to, to, to stay on track or to, to not get distracted? Um, give them a voice and see what they need and what they think would work. It, also, if it's a possibility for you and your home and, and what's going on for you, try to work in the same environment or in the same space as your child. If you're working remotely, um, this allows them to, to observationally learn what online work should look like. They work, they learn by watching you. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to be observing them and stepping in when they need help, being able to monitor them when they need help. I did another presentation recently, um, about a week ago, and one of the questions that came up was, um, a parent had mentioned that for her child having to watch eyes on screen or watching watching a face on a screen caused a lot of anxiety and um that is is certainly a real concern especially for kids with autism um and so i just wanted to mention that because um that that may be a very common issue that having to watch the eyes on the screen is 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 difficult maybe it causes anxiety maybe it is a big distraction from learning 
And so some of the strategies that were mentioned during that presentation, I, these were not all things that I, I came up with, but they are certainly good suggestions. So I wanna mention them. Um, of course, you can turn off the camera or um, lower the, the screen of a laptop so that the, the eyes are not what's visible, um, especially if it's one-on-one -on -one interaction with a, with a, between a teacher and a student rather than the whole class. Um, and, um, another suggestion was um, like a face covering or do glasses help? Or if, if someone's wearing their face mask, does that help? Um, and then finally, someone had, had suggested having the teacher and all the students kind of sit um, or at a diagonal so that they're not looking directly into the camera but rather at an angle so that the, the students are seeing the sides of each other's faces instead of um, directly looking into the, their eyes. If your child is going back into the classroom, let's talk about some of those challenges and what you can do. So before the first day of school, if possible, Share with the teacher what your concerns are and what has worked at home with your child. Given all of this new stuff, all of the new ways of interacting, this is what we have found successful. Teachers are so grateful to have that information going in so that they can incorporate, incorporate it and, and increase the child's success there in the classroom. Again, before school, <clears throat> before the child goes back into the classroom, if possible, ask the teacher for some pictures of the, the changes that are in the classroom. Um, maybe pictures of the desks being farther apart, maybe pictures of um, the, the, the sinks or the hand washing stations and the signs that are above them to show hand washing. Um, pictures of any stickers on the floor to show how to stay or, or to show the, the six foot apart distance, um, pictures of how we're gonna work in groups now. Maybe that looks different or um, how, our, how our learning pods are gonna look different. Be great if you could get a picture of the teacher in her face mask or his face mask, their face mask, so that you can show that to the child and they can expect that um, before they get there and, and are surprised to see the, the teacher. Sorry, I think I just lost my connection for a second. Um, so I was saying that um, uh, having the teacher send a picture of, of themselves in a face mask before your child sees them in the classroom and is surprised to see to, to see them looking part of their face covered. As far as getting our kids to wear face masks, I know for many it's a battle, for others it was no problem at all. If face masks are difficult, I highly, highly encourage you to try all of the different types and textures that you can find. Um, slowly build up to, to wearing the face mask over longer periods of time. Sorry, still screaming in the background. I hope you can't hear it. <laughs> um, if the face masks are, are if, if your child is really resistant to wearing a face mask, there are also those plastic face shields with um, like the band that goes around the forehead and then a, a plastic shield that covers the face but doesn't actually touch the face. So maybe that is a better option or um, um, an option that your child is more willing to wear then work on slowly building up over time how long your child will wear the mask. So if right now they, you know, refuse to wear it, try to get them to wear it for 10 seconds. And okay, you wore that mask for 10 seconds. Very well done. How was that? You, it, it, 
felt uncomfortable and you still did it. You did it anyway, because you can do hard things. And after you wear it for a few more seconds, I bet it won't be as uncomfortable and build up from there. So start with, you know, just a short time period that you're asking them to wear it and build um, a little bit longer each time. I had also uh, heard a suggestion recently, again, this is not my idea, but a possibly a, a really good idea. Um, have your kids wear their face mask during um, preferred, highly preferred activities. So for example, maybe during screen time, if they are gonna be watching videos on their iPad, make it a requirement that they have to wear the face mask while they're having their screen time. If they refuse to wear the mask, then they have to find something other than screen time to do. And if they agree to, if, if they're willing to do that, then they're getting used to wearing the mask for um, possibly an increasing period of time. Um, so win-win, I guess, either, you know, decrease screen time or or screen time with, with um, the addition of wearing the mask. Uh, use airplane arms to practice social distancing. So it's um, for for kids, especially who are not really familiar with numbers or estimating distances. It's hard to know how far apart we need to stay. So you can teach kids to have to to um to hold their arms out out straight, um, like wings. And if you and your friend both hold your arms out like this. That's how far apart we have to stay from our friends. Put it into terms that they that they do understand. Staying six feet apart doesn't mean anything to a child, but keep airplane arms apart may um, may make more sense to them. Then also we not we want to teach kids environmental cues for. Um, when to wear their mask or when they need to use their airplane arms. We don't always have to wear a mask. We don't always have to be thinking about being six feet apart. When do we need to do those things? So maybe you teach your kids, if there's someone else in the room with you, you need to wear your mask. If you're in the room by yourself, you don't need to wear your mask. Or um, if you if you don't have your mask on, you always need to be using your airplane arms. If you have your mask on, you don't. And again, this might um, differ based on the school's policy and, and how your teacher, your child's teacher is, is teaching them to when and, and how they're asking them to wear masks or to, to stay apart. Um, but kids need to be, to be looking for those environmental cues in the environment. What is it that tells me it's time to wear a mask? or what tells me that I can take it off. Um, one thing I forgot to mention when talking about uh, wearing the mask and helping kids wear the mask is also that there may be times at school that they don't have to wear a mask. You know, if they are um, working independently and their desks are six feet apart, maybe they don't need to wear a mask at that point. But if they are working in a group, they, they absolutely need to wear the mask. So for a kid who refuses to wear a mask, cannot do it, maybe the answer is they need they, they are not able to do as much group work or they, they need to um, be able to stay further apart from the other kids. And in that case, maybe that's an okay solution, but how can the teacher help that child to still remain a part of the group? To feel like they belong and they're 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 um, part of the lesson and part of the, the um, activities. We all, regardless of of how school is going to look for your child, we should expect that the transition is going to be difficult, both for the parents and the teachers and the children. It's going to be a hard transition. It's going to be hard. Many, many kids have been home for almost six months, maybe even more than six months, with their parents, with 
possibly little structure, possibly with lots of screen time, because that's how parents are managing and how parents are getting their work done. And that is okay. That we've all done what we needed to do to get through this. And we should expect that as school restarts and we have to go back to structure and less time with parents and certainly less screen time and, and more academic demands, more, more, more demands in general, it's going to be hard. And we as parents need to expect that it's going to be hard. And teachers also probably know that this is going to be a hard transition. So parents talk to the teachers if you're worried about that, let them know that this is what we've been what we've been doing, what I'm worried about. This is what I expect to be really hard so that teachers do know and they can they can prepare for that in advance. These transition difficulties are hard because what we're asking our kids to do is hard. We're going from one type of life to something that's very different. And the emotional reaction that our kids are having to that is real. So I highly encourage that if, if you know, when those, those transition issues come up, when the um, problem behavior or the, the, the crying starts, validate your kids' concerns. Validate that this is really hard. I know we've had so much fun these past months with mom and dad and, and you. It's been so much fun and it's hard to do something different. That's, it's, it's, it's real. I know that, that, that that's really hard for you. And I promise we're still gonna do lots of fun things. And it's, I promise that even though it's hard, you can do it and it's going to be okay. And we're all gonna figure it out. We're all gonna get used to this together. But don't dismiss their concerns or say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to go back to school. There's nothing we can do, this is how it is. Instead, validate those concerns because those fears that they might have or that sadness that they're feeling is real. <laughs> um, there's a lot of anxiety right now. Kids have a lot of anxiety about going back to school and about the virus itself. And those are very real concerns. Uh, so that fear of the virus is absolutely real. It is a scary thing. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a real threat to our lives. And kids have a limited understanding of it, which makes it even more scary. Um, so first of all, for kids who are, are very anxious, Specifically, if they are anxious about the virus itself and going back to school at a time when this virus exists, provide as much information as they can understand and um, uh, talk about all the things that they can control. This virus, it's, 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 it's dangerous, but there are so many things that we can do to protect ourselves that it's okay. It's gonna be okay because here's what we're gonna do to make ourselves safe. There are things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. We, not, we might not be able to control a virus and we can't control um, a lot of things, but there are things we can do and those things work and they're effective and they, they will keep us safe. And talk about what those are, why those things keep us safe, so come here, come here. <laughs> Sorry. So the fear of the virus. But if despite that, despite all the information and the, the safety measures that you can teach your kids about the virus, if anxiety is still high, or if they are just anxious in general, it's not just about the virus, but going back to school. There are lots of anxiety management techniques that you can start to incorporate into their everyday that can help to just decrease that baseline level of anxiety. So that when something stressful happens or when they encounter um, something that related to the virus that seems really scary, 
their anxiety doesn't go as high. They don't get as scared. So anxiety management strategies to try might be mindfulness, um, you know, practice being in the moment. You can use visuals like a glitter jar for that. Just bring all your attention to the glitter jar. Um, talking about what we know for sure. There's lots we don't know, but we do know right now at this very moment, we are safe. We are okay. Our family is okay. And we know that right now at this moment, somehow that, that, that the way we feel right now is not gonna last forever. That the way we're living right now is not going to last forever. And we know that because nothing lasts forever. Even when we feel happy, it doesn't last forever. And this won't last forever either. We know this for sure. Um, focusing on the five senses, using the five senses to say, um, you know, look around and, and notice three things that you see that are blue, two things that are, but two things that you can feel on your skin, and one thing that you can hear right now at this moment. The five senses help us to ground in the moment. It's mindful, it's mindfulness. It is being in the present moment and being aware of the present moment. I also want to acknowledge that we are right now living in possibly our new normal. This could be our life for the rest of this year, even longer. We don't know how and when things will go back to what we used to know. And during that time, during this new normal, how are we going to meet the emotional and social needs of our kids? There's no short term fix for any of this and there is no immediate answer. There is no, no um, you know, things aren't going back to, to, to normal, at least in the near future. And in the long term, who knows? Who knows how much of our lives are going back to what they were? Uh, um, curbside pickup at grocery stores may be the new normal. I certainly don't. <laughs> Don't have any interest in going back into a grocery store to go grocery shopping, not because of the virus, but because I hate grocery shopping. So there are so many things that may not go back to what we used to know. Um, and for at least the short term, people are missing out on lots of the celebrations and the the um, likable the, the 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 things that we had looked forward to, like the first day of kindergarten graduations, birthdays, holidays, funerals, those things aren't happening. And even if they do happen, it's not what we had expected. Maybe there's a graduation ceremony, but it's virtual. Or maybe only, only the parents are allowed to go and not extended family. We need to acknowledge all of these changes and all of these um, um, all of these milestones that are being missed because it's a grief process. We really are losing out on things and we really are grieving life as we knew it. So if you can create your own celebrations for those things, if you can um, have some sort of, of um, ceremony or, or ritual, a ritual to honor, that event that is being missed, that thing that you're missing out on. It's incredibly important because the loss that we're feeling at this time in our lives is real. Many of us have actually lost loved ones or um, are unable to see our loved ones if, if they are still present with us. We may not be able to see them in person. Um, our life as we knew it is very different. Lots of those milestones and activities are non-existent. And we are grieving that life, whether we realize it or not. So it, our kids are as well. So as much as you can, have rituals and ceremonies to, to um, help to acknowledge what we're missing out on. 
That is all the information I had for us today. Um, please remember that you can follow the Johnson Center on YouTube and the um, this webinar will be it's is recorded and it will be available on YouTube um, within the next day or so. Also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and please contact us for any any specific information or to to with any questions about this presentation or questions about your own child or situation. And I thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you for um, being here today, and I wish you all the best as we start on this journey of a new school year during a pandemic. Thank you.